Universal Darwinism is the principle that Darwinian processes operate across the universe in a range of substrates. The VRS algorithm is the mechanism whereby that occurs, namely through variation, replication and selection. The units of selection in music might be termed musemes, small replicated patterns. These form higher order structures called museum plexes and still higher order, more abstract structures called uh, a museum zaps. But there are psychological constraints on pattern perception and cognition that apply to human generated music or HGM. Computer generated music or CGM is free of such constraints and is potentially cognitively opaque to humans. So can it still be understood in terms of universal Darwinism and the VRS algorithm? Arguably yes, because the concept of a museum can be expanded to encompass machine transparent patterns and two, the VRS algorithm applies to the generation of generative systems as well as to the generation of their output CGM. HGM arguably arises through the action of what might be called the RHS GAP model, the recursive hierarchical structure generation via allele parataxis model, whereby lower level musical patterns conglomerate and generate higher order structures. And the generative algorithms most likely to operate according to this model are, are those knowledge or rule based and machine learning systems that are orientated by their programming or by their training to human generated music. Optimization systems such as neural networks will also model the VRS algorithm in the operation of their code and will tend to alight upon patterns that align with the constraints of human generated music because their fitness functions are either encoded or trained in the light of HGM. As an example of a system whose algorithms are constrained by HGM, we might refer to Stern's folk RNN system. Figure one shows three melodies associated with that system. Here we have a training input melody, number 2611, which, as the boxes indicate, contain a number of patterns quite typical of this repertoire, which tend to be either bar long or half bar long. X is a lower auxiliary note pattern here D, C, D, and Y is a rising tetrachord going from G to C. We can also see in bar three a variant of X which recurs in bar 11. This figure shows a melody generated by the system, number 2857, in which patterns from the training melody and potentially many other training melodies have been assimilated and replicated. We see here X and Y, but whereas X is retained in its X and X1 form, Y is varied according to its metrical placement. Uh, it doesn't uh, alight upon the final C on a strong beat. And it also has an initial F before the G in bar two, which arguably extends the pattern to form a tetrachord. The same grouping, of course, is seen in bar six. This third example shows the same melody, number 2857, modified by Sturm in terms of the addition of Roman numeral chord symbols and other slight changes and further modified by me. These examples illustrate two categories of musemic recurrence. Firstly, we have pitch sequence recurrences or co-indexation, where the consequent or later patterns align strongly with the metrical placement of the antecedent or earlier pattern. And thus they form perceptually and cognitively salient units, as in the case of museums X and Y. The second category 
is where we have recurrences where the consequent patterns align weakly with the metrical placement of the antecedent pattern, and thus they tend to form less perceptually and cognitively salient units, as in the case of Y1 and Z. Lerdahl remarks, apropos Boulez's Le Marteau Sans Maître, that competent listeners, even after many hearings, still cannot even begin to hear its serial organisation. For many passages, they cannot even tell if wrong pitches or rhythms have been played. The piece is hard to learn by ear in a specific sense. Its details have a somewhat statistical quality. Conditioning, in short, does not suffice. For another thing, Le Marteau does not feel structurally complex in the way, for example, that compositions by Beethoven or Schoenberg do. Vast numbers of non-redundant events fly by, but the effect is of a smooth sheen of pretty sounds. The listener's processing capacities, in short, are not overwhelmed. Lerdahl's comments also, perhaps, apply to this composition, Hello World, by the Iamus computer. Iamus uses an evolutionary developmental or evo-devo approach but it's not clear how the genotype and phenotype of biology map onto what might be called the memome and phenotype of culture in this system. Nevertheless, its evolutionary algorithm generates and mutates highly complex pitch and rhythm sequences, and these might perhaps be best understood not as musemes, but as treams, to use Blackmore's term. In Lerdahl's sense, the music it creates is cognitively opaque. CGM potentially is increasingly inaccessible to humans, certainly in terms of this system, and it tends to purge its HGM-ness and increases its CGM-ness. The VRS algorithm might drive not just the generation of human-generated music and computer-generated music, but also the genesis of the generative systems themselves. The semiological tripartition developed by Molino and Natiez argues for the existence of three levels in the ontology of an artwork, the poetic, the neutral, and the aesthetic. The poetic concerns the generation of the artwork. The neutral level is its abstract representation, its trace, as Natiez calls it. And the aesthetic level is the level of reception and response to that artwork. And this applies not just to an artwork, but to the meta-languages that accompany them. In other words, the scholarly discourses, the musical history, theory and analysis that accompany them. So not just human generated music, but also computer generated music can be understood in terms of the semiological tripartition. And this model can itself be understood in terms of the VRS algorithm. Here is Natiez's original formulation, whereby at the object level, a work is subject to the operation of poetic processes and is subject to reception in terms of aesthetic processes. The latter are informed by an analytical discourse, which is itself driven by a meta-language, which is also subject to poetic and aesthetic processes and this analytical discourse feeds into subsequent music. This can be expanded by incorporating the action of the VRS algorithm. So if we look at the bottom left hand side, the first poetic process P1 leads to the generation of a work of human generated music HGM1 by means of the operation of VRS1A. The aesthetic process itself is driven by the VRS algorithm in the form of VRS2 and that also feeds via VRS3 into the meta-language that shapes the production and reception of the analytical discourse. 
this process continues sequentially whereby further operations of the VRS algorithm feed into additional poetic and aesthetic processes on later works of HGM. In a second expansion of Natiez's model, we can incorporate another level, a second object level that refers to the generative system that produces CGM. So here we have a rich nexus of VRS processes that feed into the production and reception of computer generated music and also feed into the development of the system that produces that music. So to take just one segment of this third figure in order to illustrate the process P4, namely the poetic process that leads to the second iteration or variant, S2, of the generative system, is informed by the response, E1, to the original version of the system, S1, and by the response, E2, to the music, CGM1, that that system version produced, and also by the influence, VRS6, on P4, by the theoretical analytical discourse that fed upon CGM1. Walter Benjamin argued that that which withers in the age of mechanical reproduction is the aura of the work of art, because the technique of reproduction detaches the reproduced object from the domain of tradition. Aura is the unique phenomenon of a distance, however close it may be. In human generated music, physicality and embodiment shape the nature of museums. The fact that we are creatures living in three dimensions on a planet with gravity means that music conforms to certain image schemata, notions of up and down, in and out, big and small. And these are essentially fitness enhancing tricks that museums capitalize on to ensure their replication. We might extend the notion of aura in a neo Benjaminian sense and define it as the intersection of human physicality and the temporality of our cultural context and inheritance. Computer generated music can ape this kind of aura by virtue of the human contributions to its algorithms and its input data, but the machines that produce it cannot yet directly experience this embodied physicality. The attribute of aura imparts authenticity. In Alan Moore's definition, authenticity of expression or first person authenticity arises when an originator or a composer or a performer succeeds in conveying the impression that his her utterance is one of integrity, that it represents an attempt to communicate in an unmediated form with an audience. Second person authenticity or authenticity of experience occurs when a performance succeeds in conveying the impression to a listener that that listener's experience of life is being validated, that the music is telling it like it is for them. Authenticity of execution or third person authenticity arises when a performer succeeds in conveying the impression of accurately representing the ideas of another embedded within a tradition of performance. Moore's model is conceived in terms of what Velado would call 2H creativity. In other words, creativity by one human for another human. But we might also rethink his model in terms of AIH, in other words, AI for humans. In the case of first person authenticity, a human might perceive the integrity of a machine's utterance. And in the case of second person authenticity, a human might be convinced that CGM resonates with their own human experience. In terms of what Velado calls two AI, in other words, AI for AI, one machine, in the case of first person authenticity or first machine authenticity, might compute the integrity of another. 
And in the case of second machine authenticity, the utterances of one machine might validate the experiences of another. What might be the future for two AI creativity based upon replicated dreams? There's certainly an etiological and ontological separation between HGM and CGM. Yet both have a common underpinning by the VRS algorithm. There's certainly the potential for radical post-human evolution of music. And this two AI creativity might start with dreams that originate in HGM, but might also go well beyond what is conceivable or perceivable by humans.